the you obviously you chose to work with CCR5 because you, you felt that this was um, a, a valid first uh, um, gene to, to target um, in this with this approach. Um, but do we really know enough about CCR5 and its its function? Because as you said, that there are naturally occurring mutations. There are many, probably millions of people who are naturally have mutations in the CCR5 gene. They're mostly northern. European, or that's thought to be the origin of it. It's very infrequent, at least the Delta 32 mutation is very infrequent in, in China, for example. So that could, be the, that, uh, that could reflect either that it never sp spread here from Northern Europe, or that it's selected against in China. Um, so it's known that it, ha having mutation in CCR5 protects against HIV infection but does it predispose to other complications? So West Nile virus, we know the some evidence to suggest that increase that. And then, just a long question, I'm sorry, but I will answer that one first. What about other things? There's also a suggestion that maybe influenza, um, so patients with CCR5 mutations may be more susceptible to severe effects of influenza, which would be bad in this part of the world. Okay, so we choose the CCR5. It's for multiple reasons. So first, it's a, it's it's a, uh, HIV. It's a lethal disease in several developing countries, and also this HIV exposed but uninfected children not became a new global challenge. And uh, their study in Zambia, also also study in China, show that the those HEU children may get affected from six months to 18 months in this one year period with a possibility of 0.5 to 2.5 percent. So that is a significant number uh, compared to the kids in general. And so for this gene, we have started for decades and there's multiple clear trials on that. And uh, also for the Western layer and the other uh, potential set effect of this. So during the inferred consent, it was written down. To infer them will be West Nile virus, not infections. And also in your 18 years or even longer monitoring program, there's a, a West Nile virus uh, detection regularly. And, <coughs> do you want to follow up on that? Well, sure. I, I want to uh, follow up a bit more on that. So, um, so this is, the CCR5 obviously must have a, a function in the immune system where it normally operates, which is not, nothing to do with HIV. The immune system, we know, has effects throughout the body, and that in, includes the brain, right? It, it's known to affect aspects of functioning of the, of the, of the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the, the uh, other aspects of a brain function. Um, you cited your own work on looking at well, some evidence to suggest that there was no effect on, on behavior or, or cognition, but there has been another paper published a couple of years ago suggesting that actually mice with mutations in CTR5 had enhanced cognitive ability. So that poses an, an issue because have you inadvertently caused an enhancement at the same time as, uh, as, as dealing with this? So, um, do you think we really know enough about CCR5 and, and its role in the immune system um, to choose that as a first gene? Oh. Okay, so the first is uh, 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 I against uh, using the gene ID team for the enhancement. Uh, second, so the study you mentioned, uh, uh, I saw the paper, and uh, I believe it did more independent lab verification uh, and also for the uh, CCR5 uh, we start this uh, a reason is uh, another reason is uh, we should start with some simple well understood single gene as became a conservative first model so that maybe in the future you can move on to multiple gene more complicated genotypes okay well Matt. 
So thank you for your clear presentation. I think there's going to be some questions about um, some of the numbers in the process. So, for example, how many uh, couples have you consented? How many eggs have you obtained from each mother? How many embryos have you attempted to modify? How many then had the correct modification? And then how many were attempted to be implanted? And then how many actually gave way to birth? So what's the pipeline that you have done in, as part of this project? So there are in total eight couples enrolled for this study and um, one dropped out. And for the remaining seven couples, uh, this... Excuse me, and they were all similar in father was HIV positive, mother was HIV negative? Yes, the enrollment criteria uh, criteria requires the the father to be HIV positive and the mother to be HIV negative and plus some other age requirement. So, uh, so for all the couples, uh, they, after inferred consent, for multiple rounds um, uh, inferred consent with scientists and uh, also with the team members, and uh, then under the normal IVF procedure. So uh, collect eggs, and then <clears throat> we inject casnet protein and get on a and if, sorry, how many eggs total between the seven couples? So uh, in total, we have uh, about 31 plus sets. For that number, we see yeah, it's 30, yeah, 30 embryo plus sets. That yeah. Yeah. So 30, 31 were injected. Uh, it's It's more, I mean... Well, it's 30 it's developed to plus at stage. And with that, about 70% of the embryo were edited. 70% had biallelic editing or 70% had monolylic? And what was the percent mosaicism in those 30 embryos when you, well, that's right, you wouldn't know because you only took one cell. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, okay, so why did you decide on these two rather than the other 24? Uh, this, this couple happened to be first to be pregnant. Have you subsequently implanted the remaining in the six other couples? So it, uh, the clinical trial was paused due to the current situation. I have one other thought. Um, can you I'm from the United States, so I'm not completely familiar with um, how the review process. So how did you go through, who did you discuss this trial with in terms of your supervisors, mentors, um, other people, in terms of getting feedback on the trial design, the consent process? Who? Tell me sort of the scope of the team that was involved in designing this clinical trial. Okay. So when I start this uh, even from the pre study, study, uh, uh, I first talked to a couple of scientists and doctor to find out uh, CCR5 is the one to recommend. And uh, then uh, once I have uh, some early data on the pre I presented uh, in the Cold Spring Harbor lab meeting in New York in 2017. And uh, also in the user Berkeley Genome Editing Conference, so some of the audience also in that conference too. So I, I get feedbacks, uh, positive feedbacks, and also criticisms, and also some constructive advices. Uh, and I continue to talk to not just scientists, but also to the, the top ethics in the United States at Stanford. Like Winnie Herbert was mentioned, multiple times talk. And uh, also I, I show my pretty good data to many scientists uh, visiting. Uh, when I started a, a clinical trial for the, yeah, for the inferred consent, it's a, uh, we just, we take the NH guideline as a reference and uh, draft the inferred consent. And the later was reviewed by a U.S. professor. Uh, and when the, it's a, a pregnant, uh, this inference was reviewed again, so we had a subsequent uh, 
a supplementary material for the different consent to add the, the long-term follow-on plan. Uh, and one, yeah, and also... Let me, let me go to that. How many, how many people read the informed consent before you showed it to the family? How many people reviewed the informed consent and felt like it was appropriate? Uh, so outside of my team, there are about four people. And the, when this couple was informed consent, the, the, uh, it's, there's observer, uh, observer uh, from United States professor and also a Chinese professor in the Chinese Academy of Science. And it was, it's oh. audio recorded. Yeah. So on, on the informed consent issue, uh, was that the gained by a, a, an independent person talking to the patients or were you or your team involved in that process directly? Mm. That's including the first round, this uh, uh, team member uh, went to talk to the volunteer first for two hours. Uh, and then after about one month, mm -hmm. the volunteers came to Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. And I personally, together with to another professor, uh, give up one hour and ten minutes informed consent. But you were, so you were directly involved? Uh, directly involved. Because they were... Because after one month, they actually yeah. bring out the papers, see, off target, CRISPR things, they already mentioned that. And one more question, maybe even upstream. Um, how did you recruit these couples into your study? Was it done by personal connections? Was did your institute put out a uh, release? So how was the recruitment done of these particular couples? It's uh, by uh, uh, HIV and AIDS. Uh, volunteer group. Okay. Um, I think what we should do now is, is uh, well, start opening up for questions from the floor, but uh, David Baltimore wants to say a quick word um, first, if possible. Yeah. Um, so then when I come to taking questions, I will take questions from the general participants um, who are lined up. Um, I will also... Um, Take, I have questions uh, from the media, so I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, uh, many of them are the same, um, so I'm not necessarily going to say who asked the question because they're the same questions. Um, and, but actually also quite a few of them uh, have actually been answered uh, during Dr. Hay's talk, so I probably won't bother with those either, but I'll be quite selective. But first of all, David. I want to thank Dr. He for coming um, and for being responsive to the questions that have been asked. Uh, I still think that the statement that we made uh, at the end of the last meeting, which is that it would be irresponsible to proceed with any clinical use of germline editing unless and until the safety issues have been dealt with in this broad societal consensus, basically an open process, uh, that that has not happened and that it would still be considered irresponsible. Uh, I don't think uh, it has been an, a transparent process. We've only found out about it um, after it's happened and after the children are born. Um, I personally don't think that it was medically necessary. Um, the choice of the diseases that we heard discussions about earlier today uh, are much more pressing than uh, providing to one person some protection against HIV infection. Um, I think there has been a, a failure of self-regulation by the scientific community um, because of a lack of transparency. Um, and uh, the, I'm speaking here entirely for myself. Uh, the committee that uh, organized this meeting will be meeting uh, and issuing a statement, but that will not be until um, tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, and 
why, why don't we continue? Okay. All right. So yeah. let me take a salt off with maybe David Liu. From Hi, David Liu from uh, the Broad Institute, Harvard, and HHMI. Uh, first, I'd like to echo uh, uh, David Baltimore's comments, thanking you for coming here under some unusual circumstances. Um, I'll uh, limit myself to two questions. First, I just don't see the unmet medical need for these girls because the father is HIV positive, the mother is HIV negative, you already do sperm washing, and thus you already could generate uninfected embryos that could give rise to uninfected babies. So could you first uh, describe what is the unmet medical need, not of HIV in general, which I think we all appreciate, but what is the unmet medical need for these patients in particular? And second, um, you justify the critical decision of implanting these embryos to generate a human pregnancy with the decision made by the patients as opposed to made by the scientists and the doctors and the ethicists. Can you also comment on uh, what is our responsibility as scientists and doctors and uh, independent communities to make that decision for the patients rather than allowing patients to make critical decisions uh, like that uh, uh, seemingly on their own. Thank you very much. Okay, so the first uh, guess whether CCL5 is a unmet uh, medical need. So, <clears throat> okay, uh, I truly believe that uh, it's, this is not only just for this case, but for for millions of uh, these HEU children, they need this uh, protection since the HIV vaccine is not available. And uh, I have personal experience with uh, some people in the some AIDS village where 30% of village were, uh, people were infected. They have even have to give their children to their relatives or uncles to raise just to prevent the potential transmission. And also for this specific case, I feel it's a, I feel proud actually. I feel proudest because uh, the mark thought it, he lost the hope for the life. But when the baby was born and with his protection, he sent a message at the day of birth, say, I will work hard, earn money, and uh, take care of his two daughters and his wife for his second half of life. So, so the second, let me, can I ask, before we get to David's second question, um, you said that um, there's been no other implantations, but just to be clear, are there any current pregnancies with embryos that have been genome edited as part of your clinical trials? There is a, another one, but it tend to monitor. It's what? There's another potential okay. pregnancy. It's, it's, I think it's a, you said a very early stage, so it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a, a chemical stage. pregnancy rather than... Yes. In the interest of the transplant. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, let's, sorry, let's we do this side first, and then I'm going to ask a question from the media, so go ahead. My name is Evan Kirksey from Deakin University in Australia, and I, I have a two-part ethical question. So first, I was wondering if you could just slow down a little bit and talk about the institutional ethics process that you say that you went through, um, so looking to the past. The, the second part of my question is really about the future and, and how you understand your responsibility to these children. So your last slide indicated that you're going to be doing some follow-up treatment. So just an invitation to slow down a little bit and, and talk about your responsibility towards the future as well. Okay, so let's just uh, ask it. not you, but people here, a question. So do you see your friends, your relatives, who may have a suffered from genetic disease? So uh, for what I, I see it, those people, they need help. We should, for millions of families with a, a disease, inherited disease, or be exposed to infectious disease, we should show passion, compassion to them. And 
if we have this technology, we can make it available earlier. That would be help the much more people for the future indeed. So when talking about the future, uh, what I mean is first that it needs to be first it's a transparent, open, and uh, share what uh, the knowledge I accumulated and uh, to the society, to the world. And then let the society decide what we should do to do in that step. If I might, my question was actually much more specific about the actual children, not an abstract question about the future, but going forward with, with these children that have been born, yeah. how do you understand your responsibility to them? I mean, it relates to actually question from the, questions from the media, uh, a set of them, which is basically you know, think, questions like, you know, will you publish the identity of Lulu and Nana in the future? Um, to, how are you going to prove the effect, effectiveness of the treatment if the, if the two individuals uh, remain secret? Um, but, of course, you have this conflict between you really have to protect the patient identity in this case, um, but the world wants to know, will want to know whether they are healthy, whether the method has, uh, has any negative consequences or positive consequences. So how are you going to deal with that? Uh, so... First, it's against the Chinese law to disclose the identity of the HIV-positive people in public. Uh, okay. uh, second, so uh, for this specific couple, it's on the careful monitoring the health, and uh, I think I would propose that it's the data or, or the information should be open to necessary regulatory and uh, all necessary to have a visible panel of experts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, let's get a question over the side. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is John Pinzo. Beside my work, I also as a founding member of Inter International Tec uh, Law and Technology Interoperability Association. We discover about uh, law and technology and the future of legal profession. There are a lot of questions has been collected from our members, but I only ask a few uh, globally. One, uh, the first one, one question, please. Choose a good one. Okay. Okay, um, the good one, I think everyone is great. So uh, the, uh, the most important one is like, um, we are curious, how, would you, how did you convince the, the parents when you, um, when you, uh, when you uh, started this experiment? Did you tell them like there's alternative solutions, for example, other ways of to um, avoid of, um, of AIDS infection from, of their child? Uh, and se second, uh, it's about how did you do the ethics review? How many institutions has been involved, and how was the process? Thank you very much. Okay, so the first question: uh, How we convinced the the patient? Uh, this volunteers they all have good education background, so they know pretty much uh, a lot of information about the HIV the drug, all this alternative approach to them, or even the latest research articles published. This is common, as all the HIV-infected people, they are usually in a social network together. Well, the latest uh, advance in HIV prevention treatment information is available. Uh, so when the, the volunteer come to the informed consent, they already understand uh, quite well about uh, the genetic technology and its side effect or potential benefit. So it's a, I think it's a, it's a mutual exchange of information that made the, uh, like the volunteer made the decision. Can I ask a, a question again that goes back to transparency? Is would you be willing to post the informed consent, obviously the generic informed consent, and your manuscript in preparation in a public forum so it can be reviewed, um, such as on BioArchive or on a publicly available website for the informed consent so the community can um, read in detail about what you've done? Would you consider doing that? Yes. Actually, the informed consent is already on the NAP site, NAP website. You get to search my name, you will find it. I have an English version there, so you can read it. Mm -hmm. Second, for the manuscript, uh, even I 
when I drop the manuscript, there are already about uh, 10 people out in the lab. A few in the United States helped me to edit the manuscript. When it's ready to submit, I also send up for uh, several to give comments. So I uh, already want to uh, submit to BioArchive. It's like second my plan. Uh, but uh, some advices from some people to so should go peer review first before it's posted on BioArchive. Yeah. So I took that advice. I, I think you took that advice, but would you change your mind now because I think the circumstances have changed and I think, you know, as you can see, there's a big demand to know exactly what you did. You don't have to answer that now, but just yeah. to say, okay. yeah, you should think about that. Um, let's take a, a question here first and then I'll do another one from the media. Hi, I'm Anna Middleton and I'm Head of Society and Ethics Research at the Wellcome Genome Campus in Cambridge. I'm also a genetic counsellor and I'm very interested in the informed consent process. So if I'm understanding you right, there's a, there's a consent form that you're happy to share now. It was reviewed by four people and there was a conversation that lasted about 10 minutes with the patients. Um, given that we know, particularly in the UK, that the average reading age of the general public is around age 10 and that the vast majority of the public don't understand what the word genome is, I'm quite interested in what happened in that conversation and how you explained what the risks were and what evidence you have that they actually understood. Okay, so, yeah, I can describe that. First, uh, I don't know if I uh, correctly, you're saying 10 minutes, and it's correct, it's one hour and 10 minutes one for this couple. Okay. Uh, so what happens, it's in a conference room with uh, these couples, me and two observers. And uh, the inferred print copies was given to the couple before uh, the inferred consent. Do you know that they could read them? Did you know that they could read them and understand them? I think yeah, that. Did, did you know that they could read okay and understand what you were saying? Yeah, they are very educated. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yes, so and then, uh, so each of take this uh, inferring consent. I explain from page one to page twenty, line by line, paragraph by paragraph, and uh, and they have the right to ask any questions during this inferring consent. They get and. Uh, uh, so, the, yeah, once the, we go through the entire uh, inferring consent at the end, uh, I leave them uh, to private discussion. So you have uh, freedom and time to discuss uh, the couples, uh, and also they have the choice to decide uh, today, or you can take it home and decide uh, later. So were any of the team actually trained in taking consent? Or was this the first time you'd actually had conversations about this? But were, were any of the team that took the consent, were they trained in were the process of dealing with consent? Yeah. Were they trained at doing what they were asked to do? Uh, so, okay, so as I said, I have two rounds of uh, different consent. The first round is a team member. It's a post I mean, up. The, it's a kind of, it's informal. It's just informal conservation uh, for two hours to talk to this person to explain. The second one is the formal ones. It's I personally ex explain that. So uh, I, I do I read the guidelines from the NIH on the inferred consent, even, be, even when we are drafted the inferred consent. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, well, okay, question from, from the media. Um, can you uh, please explain the source of the funding for this, uh, this work? Okay. Okay, so uh, when I started this, uh, uh, I was, okay, I was a professor at the university. So the, when, three years ago when I began this, uh, the pre critical study, the university uh, paid the salary and the, all the uh, regions of this for pre critical study. So when, uh, move on to clinic study, all the, all the, this patient's medical care expense was paid by myself. And, uh, a small amount of uh, sequencing cost is covered by, uh, my startup funding in the university. Okay. So there was no funding from industry or from a company 
because you have, just to make it clear, you have a, an involvement in a company, but that was not involved in this project. Is that true? The, neither of my company was involved in this project right. by providing funding, yeah. people, space, or equipment. And what about, the, and did the, the families uh, pay anything or were they paid anything? So was there any exchange of, of money? Uh, so it's all written down in the informed consent that we pay all the medical expense and uh, they are not receiving much extra money for that. Okay. okay. So let's have a, <laughs> this side, sorry, Kristen. Hello, Dr. He, I'm Li Mengyin from the University of Hong Kong. And what it says there is lack of the evidence to delete this kind of gene or make it silence in human. And as a scientist who should be responsible for the patient, may we know your future medical care plan for these babies? For example, how would you give them the vaccine scheme? And also, the uh, more important thing is, how would you evaluate their potential mental health? Because they have to be under the very strict or abnormal supervision in your team. Thank you. How are you planning to monitor the medical health of the babies in terms of vaccinations and neurodevelopmental outcomes? Yeah, so with the London uh, the Health Follow-on Program, uh, the Infernal Consent is posted on the uh, website of my lab. So it's clearly the state uh, on which each year what examination will be performed, including development the neurons, uh, regular blood tests, all these informations, and plus the HIV infection, the West Dale infection, all this information. So it's all available in the, uh, in the in front of consent. Okay, Sorry, thank you. Okay. Question here then. All right, uh, Wen Shengwei from Peking University of uh, China. Uh, I have a technical question regarding the off target uh, assessment. You mentioned you did this uh, single cell whole genome sequencing. As, I, as far as I know, there's no reliable or mature technology to conduct the so-called single-cell whole genome sequencing. Uh, so this is the technical question. Second is, uh, there's a consensus uh, for to, to, to not allow to conduct a genome editing on a germline or cells. This is consensus between the international community, including the uh, Chinese community. I assume you are very well aware of this. Uh, this is a red line. Why you choose to cross this line? Uh, hypothetically, if you don't know, why you perform all those uh, clinical studies in secret? Uh, so can you explain? OK, so the first about the off-target by the sequencing. So uh, uh, before implementation, we can only biopsy three to five cells from the, the blood cells. Uh, from that, we amplify the, uh, for the single cell. It uh, compared to book cell sequencing, the, we get a, a less coverage on the whole genome. So for the book cell sequencing, we may get a 95% of genome coverage for uh, single cell. Uh, the number of cells get 80 to 83 percent of uh, coverage of genome. So that's the current uh, state of art. Uh, and uh, that means that uh, there may be off target that's missing. Uh, uh, but we, we gain the confidence. It's not uh, just look at uh, this embryo. Uh, that means we already did uh, many of them. By combining all this data together, we get to uh, understand how uh, how much of target will happen. Uh, so the, yeah. yeah. So, the, so the second part of the question, which is also questions I had from the media, yes. which is essentially why so much secrecy ar around this, when, particularly when you know that uh, the general feeling amongst the scientific community is that we shouldn't go ahead yet in doing this. So why, why is there so much secrecy from, for example, uh, the Chinese authorities? Um, so, you know, you, you know the accusation now is that you've broken the law. So if you'd involved the Chinese authorities as you were doing this, they may have said you can't do it. But you, you went ahead without really discussing with people. That's how it seems. Mm. Okay, so uh, as I said, uh, I have been engaged in uh, 
in the scientific community uh, three years ago, uh, publicly speaking, the whole spring harbor about previous data and Berkeley and also and Suzhou also has a, a host of Asian con- conference uh, and constant feedback uh, from them. Uh, when I uh, uh, moved on to clinical trials, uh, I also consulted with uh, several experts in the United States for the ethics and also uh, this sciences. So, and also the Chinese uh, people there. Okay, well, is it Maria? Sorry, yeah. Maria next. So, um, Maria Jason, Sloan Kettering uh, in New York. Uh, immediately, for me, it uh, raised uh, many scientific questions, um, but also a very personal dynamic for these two girls. So, I, that I think if it, things have been thoroughly vetted, there may have been a, a proper discussion of. But, for example, um, there are two sisters, one of whom I assume now is um, refractory to HIV infection, uh, and that was a desired outcome from the parents, or at least the father you specifically highlighted. So with, within the family dynamic, are these two daughters going to be treated uh, very differently? And then the other side of that or related to that is um, the one girl that is refractory to HIV infection, is she now going to be desirable for breeding, for, you know, <laughs> uh, will people, will, will this change her, her whole dynamic in terms of marriage and children because a spouse may be uh, particularly interested in in getting this mutation within uh, the family. So, um, you know, even this very simple thing with these two girls being different in the family and, and, um, and now uh, this being something of an enhancement, preventative um, trait, not just a, um, a, a d- disease correction, but now something new that could be introduced into the population. Yeah, it's, it- it's, it's more on, um, I think it's on my philosophy thinking of this. So uh, I have reflected deeply on this. Uh, that's why uh, I was published a, a five core value for genome editing. Uh, that's including, if I see, uh, related to what you're talking, first is respect the children's uh, autonomy. So uh, we're not uh, using any uh, these tools to control their future, their occupation, or what they could do. Uh, and uh, uh, it's to give them freedom of choice. And the second one, is, uh, we say it's a gene don't divide you. It's uh, the children should, we should encourage them to explore the full potential and uh, pursue their own life. The life is right by the children itself. But for 18 years, they're children, and uh, they they don't have that autonomy. Now their their genotype may uh, quite affect their upbringing. Mm-hmm. So, do, do, do you think the fact that their genome is going to affect how they see themselves? Uh, not even perceive themselves, how their parents perceive well, them, how their relatives well, they, perceive they, them. They will know, presumably, at some point, that they have been edited. Uh, so. It's going to be yeah, very I don't know how to answer this question. This from my eyes. No, okay. I think so. Uh, we, we, I'm being told that we're going to have to stop the session very soon. I'm just going to ask. I'm really sorry, but I think we, you, we'll have to. Uh, I just want to finish off with two questions from the from the media, which are, uh, again, uh, some of these have been repeated several several times. Um, which is really well. First of all, did you expect all this fuss? Did you expect all this reaction? Because you were, you know, even even if you had managed to succeed in your aim of having the paper, uh, you know, reviewed and published first, um, there would have been a lot of a fuss at that time as well. So, did you did you anticipate this? Uh, it's because the the news leaked out. It became all anticipated to me, yeah. because. Uh, uh, my original plan or original thinking is based on the survey of the United States or the U.S., the, uh, the British, also as the ethic uh, statement that, or the Chinese survey that's given. 
uh, as the signal that uh, the majority of the public is uh, supporting using the human genome editing for treating, including the uh, HIV uh, prevention. prevention. And then the very final, final question. So, um, okay, if this was going to be your baby, would you have gone ahead with this? Okay, it's a, uh, that's good. So if, if it's a, uh, my baby may have uh, the same situation, I would try it first. All right, so I think we should thank uh, Dr. He for his um, appearing here and uh, uh